ロイド博士の手紙により博士と落ち合うためにこのマンチェスターに来たんだよ My name is Thomas Lamar. I'm the author of The Anime Machine, currently teaching at McGill University. And I teach a wide range of things. I'm in communications, art history, cinema, as well as East Asian studies. And my general interests lie in history of media, history of sensation and perception.、Um, so I deal with a lot of different historical materials, but I tend to ask similar kinds of questions. And my research interests actually range. Really wide until, in, in terms of the kinds of materials I study. But overall, my basic interest is in history of perception, history of sensation, and the interaction with different kinds of media forms and material culture. Generally, when people ask what is anime, what they're thinking of is a certain kind of style of animation they've seen, generally associated with Japanese television animation. Although it's, it's surprising to me, right, that usually、um, for a lot of North Americans, they consider like Miyazaki Hayao also to be anime. But generally for me, and in the context of Japan, the distinction is made between certain kinds of cinematic animation. And television animation. Even though there's overlaps, they do work in very different ways in terms of their styles, kinds of narratives they use, and all the rest. So, generally, I'd say it's easiest to think of anime as being television animation. Already in the 1950s,、um, There was Toei Doga, and they were doing feature length animated films that they wanted to compete in the international market with Disney films. And their tradition of animation was building on pre war animation, really of the 1930s,、um, really famous director like、uh, Seo Mitsuyo. So there's already a lineage in Japan of cinematic animation, very well established. By the end of the 1930s, moving into the 1940s and 50s. And Tezuka worked in that industry himself, but when he turned to television, he had to rethink how he was going to do animation. And there is another lineage in Japan、um, from really the 1910s. The bulk of animation in Japan that was produced was either for educational purposes, advertisement, promotional purposes. You might, for instance, do an animated film on dentistry to show in theaters before movies. And that kind of animation continued on, especially in the Kansai area in Western Japan, through to the beginning of television. And a lot of those animators were already making television commercials and beginning to try to produce TV shows、uh, around the same time as Tezuka. Interestingly enough, in the lineage of commercials, and actually you'd see in the 1960s, a lot of avant garde media artists got really interested in the style of graphics associated with commercial. But what simply puts distinguishes them is they try to pack a lot of impact graphically in the in image to attract attention. But at that stage, they're also trying to convey a certain kind of information. So, you get a really information dense image. It's got to attract the eye and it's also got to convey something very directly. I think what people usually associate with Tezuka and thus with the kind of anime style is what's called limited animation. And it's, it's a bit of a deceiving term because it already implies that it's somehow limited or inferior. Sometimes in the North American context, it was called、um, planned animation because it was just planned in a different way. But those kinds of features we associate with limited animation are what people associate with television in general. In North America, it would be Hanna Barbera, pretty much everything, you know, up until Scooby Doo. And in the context of Japan, it would be, it would be Tezuka first. But then a whole range of different kinds of TV production quickly started to make these styles fairly elaborate. So, even though they're limited in some ways in motion, they're very, very elaborate in the way they're using backgrounds and emotion and other kinds of,、um, I guess, aesthetic features. This notion of animatism, for me, 
was a way to try to address the fact that a lot of the forms we think of as limited animation appear to be very flat. And a lot of the movements that's taking place is not so much character movement because there's less attention put into actual movement of, say, arms and legs and whatnot, but more energy put into movement of these different layers of the image. And in that context, animatism was a good concept in that, in contrast with cinema, where the dream was always to travel inside the image, to literally give the viewer the sense that they were moving into the world, it seemed with a lot of animation, particularly when it's limited, that kind of experience was not going to happen. So even in this limited animation world, if you get a sense of moving into a world, it's almost as if curtains on a theater are opening or something. You're not really in a world, you're just seeing different layers of something. So for me, it was a good way to think about how people working with animation practically began to accept those limitations and think about movement in a different way. So it was a way for me to develop this contrast between a kind of a world of moving images that you were supposed to be immersed in it, and then this other kind of experience of a moving image where a lot of the excitement and interest of it comes from the feeling of sliding across layers rather than actually entering into worlds. Historically, Disney is, is in some ways the person who pushes this the most, although there were other people in North America doing it, like the Fleischer brothers, with the development of this multi-plane camera system. Fleischer brothers, for instance, would have 3D models that they could put in these stands, and then we would put cell images in front of them. So when you look through the cell layer, you actually see a 3D image in the background. Right? They did this with their Popeye cartoons. And so there was this feeling that somehow animation needed to be more and more like cinema in terms of the way you were going to be able to move camera and track movement inside space. But it's a really elaborate process, not only time consuming, but also labor intensive. And in fact, you have to get rid of some of the other things you can do with animation. One of the, the best examples for me, you think of someone like um, Miyazaki Hayao, everyone knows him because he's such a famous director, and he generally avoids movement into depth. However, sometimes he actually tries to thematize it. He'll set up scenes where anytime someone has a gun, you get a point of view shot, you even get a sense that you can have movement into depth, uh, and even digital imagery sometimes, but then he's actually coding that in his film as being kind of a bad space, you know, sort of a technocracy or something that's going to destroy the world. Whereas all of his moments that are the most delightful and memorable and feel like this is what we want from animation tend to be animatism. They tend to be sliding clouds and moving through forests as if they're planes of things. So even when animation tr does use movement into depth, or I should say anime, there's a tendency to either limit it, like not do it very much, or when it's being done to thematize it in relation to something that's highly me mechanical, technophilic, and maybe even dangerous. I mean, for me what was interesting about Miyazaki is he hates movement into depth. I mean, he really avoids it in almost all his films. And the only time he really thematizes it is in Princess Mononoke, and he thematizes it in a very negative way. Um, it's also the first film he's using digital technologies, which he also had a really kind of negative reaction to. But I would say generally, people who are not Miyazaki, who, who are not, you know, having the same kind of relation to the image, just use these animatic or animatism sorts of modes of movement very naturally. I mean, they're not really thinking them in the first instance as being oppositional. 
they're using them as a way to organize a visual experience. I mean, the economics are part of it. Um, clearly, in the case of Tezuka, he had to produce TV shows quickly, which means you have to do it on you know, a very, very tight budget, and this limits certain kinds of possibilities. And that is true, but at the same time, what's interesting about this so-called limited animation is the economic problem really allows animators to explore a lot of things that would be ruled out if they were trying to produce the kind of classical full animation. So ultimately, it's really not just economics. It also turns out to be a set of aesthetic choices. And I think in, J in Japan, because Japan emerged as the world's largest producer of um, television animation by the 70s, huge market, really just explored so many different kinds of techniques and delivered so many different kinds of programming that it's hard to think of it as simply you know, an economic restriction that prevents them from doing something better. So I think both those things, the economics and the aesthetics, are really tightly linked in animation production. And I think that's even true today when uh, the government in Japan offered to start giving funding to studios to help them make so-called better quality animation. A lot of them refused, uh, partly on ideological grounds, but then partly for aesthetic reasons. They really want to develop their own aesthetic and their own vision with the market as they inhabit it, rather than artificially pump their animation up to compete with a style they're not interested in.